All right. Should we start our? Uh, Let's start our conversation. Let's do. I guess we should start by saying welcome to all the TDF folks who are signing on to listen to me and Mark um, run our mouths. Absolutely. Talk about a beautiful noise. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. We'll try to make it brisk and interesting. <laughs> Um, my name is Linda Powell, and I play uh, the doctor in A Beautiful Noise. I am a light-skinned Black woman wearing a royal blue shirt, sitting with a background of books. Hmm. That's cool. Well, I'm Mark Jacoby. I play the role that is is called Neil Now in our show. It's slightly euphemistic for old Neil. Uh, I am an old white guy. Uh, you know, your favorite demographic, I'm sure. And I am sitting in front of a curtain that is a drapery. If I pulled that aside behind me, you would see outdoors. So that's what, I, that's my setup. So. Well, here we go. We've got some questions to, to ask each other. And the first one is, Linda. Yes, were Mark. You, were you a Neil Diamond fan before? being cast in this show? I would have said yes, but since then I have met real Neil Diamond fans. <laughs> <laughs> the, the folks who come to our show are, are I would say, die hard. Many of them um, are die hard fans. I, I think I was a casual fan. I had a couple soundtracks in my youth. I had the soundtrack to Jazz Singer. I had the soundtrack to um, the Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Um, movie soundtrack. And being of a certain age, I, I think I knew I had, I, Neil Diamond is definitely a background of a lot of my growing up. So yes, I would say I was very excited to get the call to be a part of this because I, I did have a certain love for him. How about you? Well, to be honest, I when I picked up the script, that is the libretto, I guess we should call it since the, it includes the lyrics to the songs that are sung. I couldn't have identified a single Neil Diamond song that I could say, oh, that's Neil Diamond, including the biggie, Sweet Caroline. As I read through the script and read the lyrics, I found that tunes did come into my head that I was sort of involuntarily matching with the lyrics. So I had knowledge of it somewhere in my brain, but it wasn't in the forefront, that's for sure. You didn't uh, know I, Sweet Caroline. I Yes, I knew Sweet Caroline, but I couldn't have told you it was Neil by Neil Diamond. Oh. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. I, you know, it was one of those songs that I heard in in my. That was kind of his era is kind of my era, and I heard the songs and liked the songs, but I never really knew about. That's it. who that was. So uh, I have I have become more of a Neil Diamond fan, not relative to the people you're talking about who come to see. Our <laughs> crazy, but uh, yeah, I a lot of it. I, I very much enjoy, and I, I think my admiration for it is maybe increasing as we do the show. I'm, I'm maybe I'm listening more carefully, and uh, of course, yeah. our what we do is talk about the lyrics a lot. That's that's an important part of our interaction, uh, Linda and and me. So uh, I'm I'm finding the lyrics intriguing. Yeah, and I kind of feel like I have to say that. Um even though I just talked about the Neil Diamond fans who comes to our show, you do not have to be a Neil Diamond fan to come to our show and enjoy our show, I hope. And I have found from, from friends who've come who, who, who are surprised, A, at, at how many songs they know, and B, at how much they enjoyed the show, even with just a casual knowledge of the oeuvre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. How has a musical evolved since its world premiere in Boston last summer? Uh, I, th I think for us, uh, our particular job in the show uh, has evolved because we're, we're more integrated into the action that takes place when we're not actually conversing as patient doctor. Yep. Uh, uh, Linda plays a psychotherapist, by the way. She's not a <laughs> internist. <laughs> or a so, you know, the concept that we have, the, the premise that we have is that Neil now is in therapy trying to work through the issues of his life. And the, the way we do it is using a coffee table type book 
of the lyrics of his songs. The doctor suggests that this might be a tool to get into an analysis of what's going on with this guy. Um, so uh, then, then we see on the stage uh, many of the songs that, uh, that he wrote and the context in which he wrote them. And we've got become a little more integrated into that, um, mm -hmm. especially me, frankly, because it was my life. And uh, there, there's a scene, for example, when Neil goes to the bitter end, basically to make his uh, debut as a performer. And uh, Neil now uh, used to just be in the therapist office uh, aware of that. Now Neil now go actually goes in the end and integrates with the with the uh, audience and so forth. Little elements like that, I would I would say, would be the main thing. the The arrangements of the numbers have evolved pretty drastically. I mean, they're all there. Everything that was sung is still sung. But it, but the arrangements are always being tweaked. What yeah, think, it's the first time I've done a real out of town tryout like that. So it was it was really interesting for me to watch how they. You know, we did have a little COVID stoppage, so we didn't have a lot of preview period in Boston for them to fiddle with stuff. So we pretty much put it up in Boston. the The team was able to look at it and and really get a sense of how people responded to it and. Um, I think that in, when we, in Boston, there were a few more moments when we were off stage completely. And I think that they, they learned from watching that our framing of the story shouldn't go away. <laughs> Maybe the audience is watching things through the frame that we're providing. And so I think we're, we got rid of any moments where we, where we aren't present. And also I think that they integrated the noise into a lot more, um, of the show as time went on. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. True. we point. did a lot of restaging where they put they put the noise not and that's that's what we call our ensemble, um, not just into the the musical numbers, but they started integrating them more into the book scenes, um, so that they are also omnipresent. Um, so yeah. I think those were the major changes. Yeah, little tweaks to the to the script, of course, which is sort of maddening in a way because it's so much easier to learn a brand new scene than it is to learn all tiny little alterations to an already existing scene. So it can be frustrating. And there are still moments in our first scene where if, if something's a little off or something blows my concentration, I throw in an old line and I'm like, oh, it's just in my muscle memory. Now. of my mouth that it'll just come out and I'll be like, oh, I'm not supposed to say that anymore. Yeah. Okay. Listen to this one, Linda. Okay. <laughs> at the top of the show, we both stare at each other silently through multiple blackouts. And to indicate or to show to the audience that time is passing, that these are separate um, therapy sessions, we uh, each do multiple amazing quick changes. Mm -hmm. As... I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Has there ever been any mishap? <laughs> yes, there have been mishaps, but I'm not sure we can detail the mishaps without giving away what is actually a magic trick. So I don't know if we can describe the mishaps, but I will just say well, Mark, has, Mark has suffered more mishap than I have. Oh, my fault. I, see. <laughs> I didn't. No, see, I didn't say it was your fault kind of your luck it's really very you know it's i i don't think we're giving anything away when we say that the dressers run in from the wings quickly help us remove our clothes and put new clothes on and we sit back down and the lights come up in in three seconds <laughs> <laughs> it's magic I will one thing i will say about that trick is that all through rehearsals um when they were just explaining to us what would happen and they'd call blackout now you're changed blackout now you're changed i was convinced that it was never going to work and that it would be cut in the first um day of tech and then when it wasn't cut the first day of tech i was sure it'd be cut by the first <laughs> week of previews and and um darn it they didn't prove me wrong it works it works it works really well, well it's one of those things you know when you do a performance with all the, these elements singing and acting and t t there there are times you'll say well it was how did it feel it felt pretty good this 
particular thing that we're talking about now, this effect at the beginning of the show, it's an either or, or situation. It either works and it's brilliant or it doesn't work and it's crash and burn. There's no in between. <laughs> I will so say I, the, the, the mishaps have been few, few. They have, they have, but when they happen, it's searing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, your characters, our characters, spend a lot of time on the sidelines watching the action unfold. How do you stay engaged and do you ever have to stop yourself from singing along? <laughs> well, uh, it's a good question. It is a challenge. These kinds of roles uh, where there are, there are interjections, maybe there'll be two pages of of text and one or or the other or both of us will have interjections uh, one has to be alert that's true so it's just a and it's a, it's an exercise in discipline and an exercise in concentration not not the same kind of concentration that is called for when you have a two-person scene and it's back and forth and back and forth uh a different kind of just making sure you're there um this is an interesting question. The the kind of the second part of this is, um, you know, are you ever, ever tempted to sing along, or do you catch yourself being tempted to sing along? And the question is, what if we did? Would that be wrong, Linda? What if we did sing along? I mean, we we comment at times on the numbers as musical numbers, mm -hmm. not just as as lyrics which is not exactly consistent with our premise that what we're doing is analyzing the lyrics. So I've often wanted, wanted to talk to you about this. And why not this TDF conversation? Why not here? Why not now? Yeah, I think we're, <laughs> two, we're in two different positions as far as our listening and our participation and our singing are concerned, because I feel like, yes, we're examining the lyrics, but I think in examining the lyrics, we've never had this conversation that you're also um telling me what was happening in your life that brought about those lyrics so when the scenes are, are taking place in front of us i'm watching them as if this is what you're telling me and so for me my listening and my concentration the the way I've structured it for myself is, is I'm, I'm watching some, I had a, an interview once where somebody asked me, what's it like to pretend to listen the whole time? And I'm actually trying to listen <laughs> the whole time. I'm not trying to pretend to listen. I'm trying to really listen to what's going on. And some nights I'm more successful than others. Some nights I'll hear the cue and I'll be like, wow, I was someplace else. I'm glad this part of my brain is still here. Um, but that's a fun challenge to to stay listening and stay watching the scenes and still try and get information from the scenes to feed what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily the doctor knows when the scenes are going on, the music and the lyrics, whereas Neil might, you know? Um, I know everything except Forever in Blue Jeans. That yeah. is the big jarring part in the show for me. Maybe Maybe we're getting too... <laughs> thick yes. to our own work. But there is one there is one song in the show that I I am not really relate uh relating it to Linda. I'm not telling her about it because it's a sentiment that ex is expressed by another character that I wasn't necessarily privy to at the time. I can't say and then Marcia said like I can everything else in the show I can say and then I went to the bitter end and I mm -hmm. sang uh, you know, solitary man. And then, uh, you know, everything else is something I'm telling you that happened except that one number. So it, it's been a challenge for me to, to figure out where I am at that point. You, you are the one who suggests uh, maybe she wanted, maybe she, what she wanted was more time with more you. Time with you. Things. So it's really a thought that's going the other way than, than the way it usually does. Kind of interesting. It's a, it these is. are very challenging parts. Let me let me just say. I mean, we <laughs> we know that, and we've talked about it. But the, the, there's just a lot to dig into. There's that. a lot to dig into, and um, it's also like one of the first moments where another character steps forward to kind of face the audience and talk about what she's feeling and experiencing. So yeah. no, that's not true. Um, 
no, others are staged that way, but this is really the only one that is that thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have I just find myself humming along, I have to say. One one day they started uh, Suleiman, and Linda was just Su Sula, and then I went, oh, I don't know this song. I'm not supposed to know this song. I kind of sing that <laughs> when I wander through the crowd. I, I sing a little Suleiman. Yeah. And I, I think I hear you humming from time to time, and I, I know I, I kind of <laughs> exercise the voice a little bit. I mean, our mics on on. Sometimes I just hum to make sure that I don't have something in my throat. It's like <laughs> sometimes I hum to make sure I'm still alive. <laughs> uh, let's see. Who's is this? Me? I think it's your turn. Now, speaking of singing along, Diamond Heads do that frequently during the show with encouragement from the cast. What are your most memorable audience reactions? <laughs> I'm trying to think of some good ones. There are some very um, appreciative people sometimes, and there are also people who clearly have been to a lot of Neil Diamond concerts and are trying to recreate that experience for themselves. Um, I don't know. Most that's, memorable That's ones. what I always, when describing the experience of doing the show, I like to say half of the people there think they're at a rock concert and half people think they're at a play. And these are these don't have to necessarily be in conflict, but it, you well, do feel a little bit of different energies with different audience members. Yes, yeah, certain audiences will have more one or more of the other, and I think part of the trick, part of our trick, is trying to make sure you pull the audience along the story we're trying to tell. And some nights, um, the the energy you have to use to do that is different than other nights. Yeah, um, it was on Sunday afternoon last that we had a group of guys in the front row. And I, I thought they lost their way on, on the way to a monster truck rally or something. They, they, they seemed to, I mean, they were incredibly energized and incredibly enjoying, you know, they totally loved the show, but they, and hollering. it became, they became an event. Um, so that's probably, fun to watch. that's probably the extreme. There's other people, sometimes people will come in with an observation uh, that is, oh, yeah. some individual will say something out loud that either comments on what's happened or adds to it or maybe predicts what's going to be said next. <laughs> the other night, Mark said a, song, a certain song was three minutes long and the woman in the front row was like, five. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> All by herself. <laughs> it's like she knows the canon. It's five minutes long. Um, you know, it's fun for me to watch is I really feel like there's a, we had a talk back the other night where, where someone kind of expressed this. There is like a, you and you and Will become the vessel for their Neil Diamond love. Hmm. You know? And it's like they they come in willing to make the two of you Neil Diamond and everything they've ever thought and loved about Neil Diamond um, is put into their their um appreciation and enjoyment of of the thing and most nights that's pretty beautiful sometimes they're very very um participatory and there are a couple points where it's like it's great and it's expected but there's sometimes when it's like a sad love song or something you don't want a breakup moment you don't necessarily want the audience singing along when you're it's a storytelling moment <laughs> yeah yeah you know? i agree mark Yes, I'm here. You play Neil Diamond now, and Will Swenson plays Neil Diamond as a younger man. Did the two of you coordinate on your respective approaches to the character? Uh, I'm going to say not in a systemic or patterned way. We have spoken frequently about various aspects of the show, various aspects of the man, uh, uh, and, you know, how we, since we are a single, <laughs> perceive a particular event. Um, but it, it, it's been, it's been in the, in the nature of an ongoing discussion rather than, okay, let's sit down and formulate this thing for the two of us. One issue uh, has been vocal quality. Uh, maybe I'm, maybe this is a bit of a spoiler, but um, 
you know, uh, I, I've heard Will uh, talk about this. To what extent are we replicating or attempting to replicate the sound of Neil Diamond? Uh, so it's a fa very fine line to, to walk between an interpretation, uh, an attitude, and an actual impersonation or imitation of, of the person. And um, I don't think, I think that affects Will much more than it affects me because he's playing Neil Diamond when Neil Diamond was a huge uh, singing and composing star. Uh, the small bit of singing that I do is, it, it's not really Neil Diamond performing, it's Neil Diamond, Diamond working into a, a place in his life that, that he can accept. And it, it's not to be taken literally, oh, that guy, that older Neil Diamond is now singing. Uh, what what he's doing, I think, I mean, my interpretation of it is experiencing a breakthrough in his in his therapy. Mm -hmm. By the way, Will Swenson, we keep referring to Will, that he plays young Neil Diamond and, and is the star of our show. Uh, and his connection to Neil way before this project was ever developed is is extensive his his father will's father uh was a huge neil diamond fan as i understand it as growing up will's the garage of their home where they lived was basically a shrine to neil diamond with posters and memorabilia and you know everything about it uh and will's got it in his bones so if anything that will can tell me about neil i'm all ears mm -hmm. uh and any interpretation, well, I guess it's okay to say, maybe, I don't know, Linda may disagree, but we do have an occasion to sing a short passage together, Will and me. And I totally defer to him with respect to phrasing, stylizing, you know, because he's got it in his bones. Hey, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> This musical makes a great case. What musical? That would be a beautiful noise. Oh, right. The Neil Diamond musical. I was really, I was doing well with this question. And you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a beautiful noise makes a great case for the healing power of therapy. And TDF is all about the healing power of theater. As people and performers, what do you do to center yourself? I think, well, I mean, as, as, as people, as a person, I, I, I center myself. I, I need a certain amount of alone time that centers me. Um, I am a, a meditator, um, mindful in this meditation. I do a little bit of that both in my life and um, as a person and in my life as a performer. Um, as an actor, for me, this to go back to listening. Listening centers me. Listening centers me. So if I if I can if I can put my energy towards listening and taking in the things going around me, that centers me. Our the teacher that we both worked with and where we met um, it was big on meditation. I think it was Michael very Howard. Don't yeah. You think? yeah, Michael, Michael, definitely. Um, I always did a little bit, but he, he, he would always encourage us to, to take a minute, take a breath, mm -hmm. be still. And the studio offered, uh, at times, at least I, I took a medica meditation class at Michael Howard studios. Um, as far as, as far as centering me myself as an actor, I don't have, anything additional to add to what Linda said as just as a person, my thing is <laughs> regimen. And <laughs> I kind of chortle when I say it because it, it's excessive. I need to see a therapist about it because I am so regi regimented, you know, a, a certain process that I have to go through in order to well, to live, but in this case, limiting it to, you know, having a job, a theater job where you're called upon eight times a week to go out and jump. You know, I have to do my stretching. I have to do my steaming. I have to do my vocal work. Uh, 
and if I if I if something happens and I don't get to do it, it's jarring to me, and I feel all discombobulated. And I'm I'm really kind of serious that I I think it's excessive. I think it's excess. Um, it's compulsive. I have to organize. You know, it's if I say I have to do 15 minutes of stretching before my show, and I only get in 13 minutes, it's it's rattling to me. But that's I call <laughs> I say that's how I center myself, and in a way, I, it's it's something to cling to. You know, it's a it's a formula. Uh, you know, like athletes. I'm thinking now of pitchers in baseball. Mm -hmm. They have their routine. And, you know, a starting pitcher has his routine and a long reliever and a setup man and a closer. And they all have a particular way they go about it. And if that's ever messed with, like in the playoffs, when you might have to bring in somebody who's normally a starter to, to relief into relief, frequently they they can't do it. It's because they haven't prepared the normal way. They haven't had their four days of rest between starts. And so so it's kind of like that. Is it, is it, I mean, now we're getting personal. We can cut this part out. Um, <laughs> is it, is it that way in your entire life or yes. just in your work in your entire life? Yes. Yes. In my work and in my life. Yes. I'm a, I'm a keeper of records. Uh, you know, I, I, I know everything has to be ordered. Yeah. And yeah. It's very. Order is not a bad thing. Like, like eating, like diet, you know, I, I know how much I eat every day. I'm not on a diet as it were. We are such opposites. We're all on a diet. You know, we, we have diets, we eat. Uh, and, but mine, you know, the, there are no questions about what it is. I know exactly what it is. <laughs> it's really something. <laughs> oh, I mean, exhausted. I'm not a therapist, but I play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, whose turn is it? I think it is you. Um, I think it's. Let's see. Oh, it doesn't matter. You. Your best it's Neil you. Diamond story. Go. Neil Diamond. I don't have a lot of Neil Diamond stories. Uh, I have met and spoken with Neil Diamond and conversed with him uh, in a limited way. But the thing I remember about him. One thing that really resonated with me, he came to watch rehearsal when we were um, about to go to Boston. He came to rehearsal in, in May of last year. And uh, of course, it was very exciting. And uh, we were all very aware that he was there. <laughs> if you're playing somebody who's sitting seven feet away from you. But at one point in the show, the show, as we ran through the show, as we rehearsed the show, Neil put his arms up into the air over his head and held them there. And for me, it was a particular, I, I don't know what it meant. I don't know if it meant anything. It was some sort of, I assume some sort of emotional connection to physicality. Something caused him to do that. And it really stuck with me. And I actually <laughs> use it in the show I didn't know that's where that came from. Because it's, Beautiful. it's a, uh, well, I, it's, I guess it's a little bit of an homage to him, remembering that he did that and how touching it was at the time. And it's also, because it's physical, it's, it's the, str the struggle, the effort. This great moment when he wrote this great song came out of a great effort. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just sort of decided to see if I could physicalize that in the show at one point. I love that. Um, the day after that run through and they, they sent word that he enjoyed it and he wanted to come the next day to the run, the next run through. So he came back and, but he had seen it at that point. And so as we were all mingling around the room, um, they said, okay, we're going to start now. So Mark and I went and we got in our chairs and he saw me and he walked forward, he said, Linda. And so I got up to talk to him and um, he told me a little bit about his therapist who had passed away and, and then we were just chatting, but I, I could feel that the room had gotten um, quiet and everyone was just waiting 
and and we were chatting and I finally put my hand on his on his arm and I said, you know, I think you need to sit down because nobody's going to start without you. And he said, oh, oh, is that true? And I said, yeah, and I think so. So he went and he went to the side of the studio where we had the chairs set up, but he didn't sit down. So everybody just waited because we thought maybe he was going to say something. And then, um, you know, a little awkward for a second. And then the stage manager said, oh, Mr. Diamond, um, did you want to say something or we're getting, we were ready to start? And he said, well, I was told you wouldn't start until I sat down. I just wanted to see if that was true. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty awesome. That's cute. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. What's the best deal you ever got at the TKTS booth? Okay. <laughs> Years ago, <laughs> my my niece, who was pretty young at the time, she must have been 12 or something like that, wanted to come to New York and wanted to see Chorus Line. Uh, okay. Let's go, come come on, and Uncle Mark will take you to see Chorus Line. And we went to the TKTS booth, and we waited in line. And when we got actually to the window, no tickets to Chorus Line. Oh. So, okay, okay, here's what we'll do, Kristen, her name. Let's go over to the box office and just see if there's anything at the box office, and we'll just pop for actual, you know, full price tickets. So we went over to the Schubert Theater to the box office, nothing, sold out, sorry. And she was so disappointed. I was so not disappointed not to be able to do for her what she wanted. Okay, let's go back to the TKTS booth and we'll get something, we'll go see something today. So we go back to the tickets booth and we get in line and we get up to the window and they have chorus line. So, and it was just like so serendipitous. <laughs> we, were, we were happier than the, we would have been had we gotten the tickets in the first place. I presume that what happens is at a certain point, the box office sends tickets over to the tickets booth that did not sell at the actual box office. So, so in that timing, we caught up with the tickets that had just been sent over. I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's my happiest memory of the TK. That's a great one. Well, now I feel bad because I really don't have, I don't have an answer to this question, but I will say one of my favorite things to do is um, a random matinee by myself with no decision about what I'm going to see to just go to the booth and see what's up there and, and take it and surprise myself and go see something. Um, that's my, that's my TKTS tradition. <laughs> cool. This will be our last question. So careful how you answer. Uh, right now, we are being asked to be each other's casting directors. What role would you put the other one in? <laughs> I, I want you to say yours because right. I want to say what right. happened last night. Huh? You say what you were going to say. Because I didn't oh, look at the questions last this was, night. This was and so go ahead. Mind blowing to me. I I looked at these questions in the dressing room when they came through on the on the internet, and kind of thought about them, and then before before the show starts, Linda and I are seated in our chairs behind the curtain, and we have time to to chat. And uh, Linda said something about the Matchmaker by Thornton Wilder which of course, the musical version is Hello, Dolly. And my jaw just dropped because that is the very thing that I was Actually, going to. Actually, I said, Mark, you and I should do the matchmaker. I mean, <laughs> what are the chances of that? And I had Linda, not, I didn't Linda know the question. You know, great gravitas as an actor. And, you know, you, you think of, you know, how about Medea or something, but she's also extraordinarily funny. And I, I think it would be a kick for me at least to see her in just a flat-out comedy. Yeah, uh, I don't, you know, noises off or something that is just hysterically funny. Uh, but the the one I came up with was Matchmaker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's funny because I had not looked at the questions, and and so he was like, "Why are you talking about Matchmaker?" I was just thinking that, and I said, "I didn't look at the questions. It must be my." 
latent psychic abilities. And, and since then, I've like, well, I can't do matchmaker because that's cheating. But now I can't not get out of my head that you and I should do matchmaker. And I would love to do that with you, <laughs> Horace Van de Gelder. I don't know if that's his name. And, but um, I would it also is, like to play as well as the. It is the same? Yeah. Yeah. I would like to see you do Jayquees and as you like it. I would like to see you do Shakespeare and, mm. and bring all your gravitas and. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I love the way you use language when, and so I'd just love to hear you do heightened text sometime. Okay, let's work on that. Yep. Mutually. Well, it's thank saying you. thank you. I think so I, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Linda. This has been fun. It was fun. We, it was fun. <laughs> and thank you all. Yeah your support of TDF and thank you for TDF for thank, asking us to do this. Amen. Great. And um, please come and check us out in a beautiful noise. <laughs>